right. Hello, everybody. A very warm welcome to our inaugural session of the Dissecting Capitalism Season 2 webinar series. Um, I guess we all have binged watch so much of Netflix during the pandemic, it even shows in our event titles now. Um, so the main aim of the series uh, has been to understand what is capitalism, how does it affect economic activities, socio-political environment. And in our previous session, we had eight eminent scholars presenting their take on poverty, inequality, wealth, income, economic policy, and the interactions with capitalism. We had the opportunity to host Professor Raina Rovabai, Anthony De Costa, Daniel Bromley, Elizabeth Anderson, Sanjay Reddy, uh, Benjamin Devi, and Sabina Alkar. Uh, the link in the chat box will direct you to the recordings of these sessions in case you have missed them. And we found that there was so much of enthusiasm and inquisitiveness around this topic among young scholars, uh, and also the fact that we wanted to reach out to more academicians and experts to present their views on this complex yet ubiquitous structure that we call capitalism. Here we are with season two. This session uh, for today is titled as Capitalism and Climate Change, an Asian Perspective. I will request Satvik to introduce our speaker who will be taking us through this topic. Over to you, Satvik. Thank you, Anisha. <clears throat> Today, we are extremely lucky to have Professor Joyti Ghosh. Uh, professor Ghosh is a professor of economics at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Before that, she taught for nearly 35 years at the Jawaharlal Nehru University in New Delhi, India. She is a world-renowned economist and public intellectual. She has recently uh, become a member of WHO Council on the Economics of Health for All. Like Anisha said, uh, she would be speaking on capitalism and climate change and Asian perspective. She would be speaking for about 45 minutes and we will have another 45 minutes or so for Q&A. If we still have time and interest, we will we'll be happy to have an informal chat after the official session has ended. And that part will not be recorded, of course. Professor Ghosh, thank you very much for your time. The floor is yours. Uh, Professor Ghosh, yes. yes, I'm muted. Sorry, sorry about that. Yes, well, thank you very much, uh, Satvik, Anisha, Varsha, and others in YSI. I'm always very happy to join you because I know that uh, you guys are our, our future and will possibly save us from <laughs> the, the economics discipline and uh, and economic policy in making in India. So it's really uh, it's always a pleasure to be with all of you. And I'm going to actually go straight into it. So let me begin sharing my screen. Um, yes, can you see the screen, everyone? Yes, fine. So yes, I'm going to talk about capitalism and climate change. It's actually more, in fact, about climate change and the implications. And I will draw out what exactly we can do within what is still the capitalist framework we're in and how much we need to change. Obviously, ideally, we would not have this framework at all because it is leading us to planetary destruction. But if we could, uh, we can still change essential elements of it that would allow us to get out of this terrible predicament. So let me just emphasize, I don't need to tell all of you, right? You're experiencing this. I don't have to tell you about it the other way. But I think what's important to remember is that this is actually just sad to say the beginning of the end, uh, at the beginning of a much, much longer process. Some of you were saying something about how, you know, this, this discussions that you have after these lectures are good for relieving stress. And I'm, I hate to tell you, I'm going to be adding to your stress a little bit in this lecture because what we have is really urgent and I cannot underline the extent of the severity of this crisis. We are getting these impacts way before we were supposed to have them. This kind of prolonged heat in so early in the summer was expected maybe 10 years from now, including by the IPCC. So we are actually getting, right now in India, we are seeing that the climate change is much more dramatic than even the IPCC, which has been not just very sober and terrifying in its uh, uh, 
projections, but pretty much all climate scientists have been projecting. So we know that the heat waves are more frequent, they're harsher, they're more prolonged. Uh, well, you, you're in, the, in India, so you know better than me that we've had a, no spring effectively, and almost two months of more than 45 degree temperature. Today, I'm told in parts of Pakistan, it reached 50 degrees, possibly in parts of North India as well. Now, this obviously has major implications. Just the heat alone is going to affect the Ravi harvest. And there are estimates of anywhere between 15 and 30% in terms of decline in the wheat harvest in particular. Remember, India is the largest, the second largest producer of wheat, okay? It, we don't trade it so much, but we need it hugely for domestic consumption. And if something like that, such a severe drop in India's wheat harvest happens, that obviously affects India, but it affects global supply. And we already are facing massive global increases in wheat uh, prices and, and various um, oil feed prices because of the Ukraine war. So this is something that, again, has global implications. And of course, it's terrible for India as well. Already, there are estimations that the current rainfall deficiency uh, this is pre-monsoon, obviously, but it's very, very high in some parts of the country, almost you know, close to 90% rainfall deficiency. We know that this will be accompanied by water shortages, drought, greater and greater difficulty in accessing both groundwater and surface water, larger problems of time use for women in collecting water. We know that there are power shortages already, and it's not just to do with coal at all, it has to do much more with the stress on the grids and on the system as a whole because of the heat. And obviously there is a significant impact on human health and mortality. I think uh, the wet bulb factor, which is being talked about a lot in India, the combination of high heat and high humidity is actually uh, deadly. Now, this is just the heat part. This is what's already happening in our own country right now as we speak, and it's happening in several other parts of the region, and it will soon happen in many other parts of the tropical and subtropical regions of the world. And we know that there are raging wildfires already in California, which is now in its 10th year of drought. We know that last year we got wildfires in places as unbelievable as Siberia, Siberia in, in Russia. Uh, so we know that marine life, is in threat of extinction. Major species are being threatened with extinction because of the major, the decline in the, the heating of the water as well as the changes in the oxygen levels in the water. And we know that the ice caps started melting in January. We don't know the full implications of this melting of the ice caps in the Arctic and the Antarctic, but we do know that they will be implications, they will be severe, necessarily. There's no way getting around the fact that in the coming few months, we are going to see very significant changes in sea levels, in the further increase in temperature in the water, in all kinds of worsening effects of La Nina, El Nino, all the weather, various weather currents and so on. Okay, very, very bad news, right? Sorry about that, but we have to say it, it's happening. We can't pretend it's not happening. Okay, so now what are we doing about it? How do we deal with this? So this is again, one of those things which, you know, if someone could from Mars or wherever could come and watch us on our planet, they would say, my God, these people are weird. Human beings are weird because they are treating what is clearly a planetary problem in terms of national boundaries. And obviously climate change, like the pandemic, but even more so, is not something that is bound by passports, visas, you know, border crossings. It goes where it goes. And you would have to deal with it that way. You cannot say we're going to stop dealing with it at our national boundary. And yet that is what we have been doing. That is what we continue to do at the national level. So we have um, essentially countries are assigned a kind of climate responsibility based on our current national carbon emissions. And it is this evidence of the current national carbon emissions, which is taken to be the basis for all of the negotiations on climate change, on the 
degree of global warming, the responsibility for it, and the future national commitments to control carbon emissions. I mean, most recently we saw in November 21, in COP26 in Glasgow, a significant, um, some people would say, an improvement in the commitments made by various national governments, and others would say, well, uh, not nowhere near what is required. But it's essentially all different national leaders coming and saying, my country will do the following. And usually the following is something very far in the future. By 2050, we will get to net zero emissions was a very common refrain in a lot of the advanced economies. Uh, India and a bunch of other countries were criticized for not saying we will get to net zero by 2050 and instead claiming that they would, um, you know, perhaps by in, in a future period and also not committing to reductions in coal use as, as the dirtiest form of energy generation. Uh, there are lots of problems with net zero. Maybe we can come back to that if you have questions about this, but essentially the net zero commitments rely on some estimations of how much you are doing you know, carbon trapping, how much you're doing in terms of trading. And so you can reduce your net zero, your uh, carbon emissions to net zero, even when you're actively producing more carbon. So we'll come back to that. But also what is important is that this current responsibility ignores the historic responsibility, what has been called carbon debt. And we know that the richer countries are dominantly responsible for most of the emissions that we face today. The problems, the heat in India today is not because we have been sort of badly behaved in the last uh, few years, but because we are, um, if you like, the, uh, the um, victims, like much of the developing world and the tropical areas, uh, we are the victims of a process which has been going on for a much longer period in which the way capitalism has played out has been dramatic overuse of and ex over exploitation of nature and lack of concern for the impact on the environment and the climate. But also there are other problems with the way in which the national responsibilities for carbon emissions are derived. Uh, they rely on the purchasing power parity measures of GDP for comparing across countries. There are many problems with this measure, not using market exchange rates, but PPP. I won't go into them right now. The relevant one for us is that these overstate the incomes of poorer countries. And so what that does is to give poorer countries, you know, a, a, a sort of inflated sense of their relative incomes, and therefore you're assigned greater carbon responsibility. You're, you know, you can afford to do it kind of thing. Also, Measures of carbon emission, typically, at least for the IPCC and for the, I, uh, the UNFCCC, where the COP negotiations take place, they are based on domestic production, how much you are producing carbon within your national boundaries, rather than how much you are consuming of carbon emitting production. And of course, that means that the North, which has continued to import a lot of carbon emitting produced goods from the South, uh, their carbon emissions really get undercounted, if you like. So uh, northern countries have used trade, especially in the first decade of this century, have used trade to reduce their own uh, internal national carbon emissions in production terms, but they continue to import goods from other countries, uh, specifically China, but a bunch of developing countries, which use a lot more carbon. So their consumption is much more carbon intensive. But because of these, then in fact, if you look at the global discussions, everyone's pointing a finger at China and India in particular as the countries in which carbon emissions have gone up very dramatically in the last two decades, especially China, but also India. Let's just look at the carbon debt to begin with. Now, here is an estimate of the historical debt of uh, of countries in a very long period between 1850 and 2007. Of course, lots of uh, you know, assumptions and all of these calculations, as you all know, but this is the one that is generally accepted. What's remarkable here is that today's developed countries, remember, they're less than 15% of global population, in fact, around 14% of global population. 
This group is responsible for nearly 80% of the cumulative carbon emissions over this one and a half centuries. 80% of it is just this small group of 14% of the world's population. Now you can say, well, wait a minute, this is one and a half centuries, nobody knew carbon emission was a problem, no one had heard of greenhouse gases, why are you blaming their ancestors for things that happened when people didn't know about this? Well, it turns out that more than half of this occurred just in the last 30 years. And frankly, in the last 30 years, we have all known about greenhouse gas emissions. We have known about carbon emissions and the problems and the need to mitigate them and all of that. And so much more could have been done already in the rich countries in terms of climate mitigation. Technologies also existed and were being developed. Nonetheless, in fact, as I said, more than half of that historical carbon debt occurs just in the last 30 years. What's more striking is that even if you look at the COP26 commitments, the, those made in Glasgow, that would still give rich countries almost two thirds, 60% of whatever total carbon use we can do globally to keep within the 1.5 degree target set by the UNFCC. Now, I think, well, we won't go into it, but we already know that well before 1.5 degrees have been reached, we are facing all kinds of very, very major changes in climate. So many scientists are questioning whether 1.5 degrees is a very safe level. Um, many are even you know, questioning whether we are not going to see some of the worst anticipated effects even at one degree. But what's also more frightening is that even this 1.5 degree target is not going to be met on current trends. On current trends, even two degrees is not going to be met by 2050. In other words, we are really heading for, we're, we're rushing headlong over a cliff globally in terms of the levels of emissions globally and what it's going to mean for everybody across the world. Because as I said, climate doesn't respect all of these uh, planetary or sorry, national borders. So it's going to really affect everyone. So now let's look a little bit at these methods for determining carbon emissions. So one way of doing it is to look at, just as I mentioned, the production base. This is what the UNFCCC, uh, how the international negotiations are formulated. In this one, the responsibility is placed on the producers of goods and services within that location. Typically the nation, but it can be the area, the region, the state, whatever. So whatever you're producing there, all production, uh, agriculture, industry, whichever services use carbon, if you're mining Bitcoin, that's very carbon intensive, for example. Whatever point in the value chain, whatever you're, it, it is being emitted in that area, that's the production based part. Now, obviously, as I mentioned, it doesn't capture cross-border trade, which includes consumption. I mean, what you would do is basically look at the carbon emissions in your imports and minus or subtract the carbon emissions in your exports. So you would orient it differently. Extraction-based is a different way of looking at it, where you're looking at the life cycle of extracted natural resources, because you know those are really the big place where a lot of the carbon emissions are happening, the use of energy. Uh, and then you try and allocate the responsibility to those who are extracting the resources. So whether it is petroleum or it is coal or it is any of these resources, you're considering the downstream emissions enabled by the sale of that resource or fuel. And uh, this would be, it's a more value added approach, but it's essentially confined to those resources, typically fossil fuels, but it doesn't only have to be fossil fuels. Or you can look at value added emissions. That is you allocate the responsibility according to the share of the value added over the life cycle of the product in each step of the value chain. This is a much more sophisticated measure and it's therefore much more complicated. It's very difficult to actually get the full measure of uh, this. And some brave people have actually tried to do this. Uh, there are estimates of this. Uh, naturally, they involve many kinds of assumption, but nonetheless. And then there is consumption-based emissions, which I would argue is possibly the most relevant actually in terms of who's responsible. And those are what result from whatever you need to satisfy domestic demand, both consumption and investment. So you're taking responsibility for all the life cycle emissions 
uh, of the, a particular product and putting it on the final consumer, whether it is through consumption or investment. I'm going to call it consumption-based, even though it includes investment, because it's really your spending pattern and how that determines the what, what in emissions are embodied in your spending pattern, okay? Now, let's look at the production-based emissions, which is really what is talked about in all of these global negotiations and discussions and in all the headline news that you get uh, about climate. And it's very clear, China has become the largest emitter, okay? The orange lines are 2019. So kind of pre-pandemic, a little bit it went down in the pandemic year, but let's just look at the basic thing here. Orange line is China, which has not just exceeded the US, but exceeded by many, you know, I mean, it's doubled practically the US level. Earlier, the US was the largest emitter. Over the past decade, China has surpassed it and surpassed how? I mean, just massively, right? Um, India has become the third largest emitter in aggregate terms. And so really that's why in Glasgow, everyone, including small island states, were all you know, saying, look at China and India, you've got to stop, you can't do this and so on, okay? Russia, very large emitter, it's, a natural, it's an oil and natural gas producer. You will find that all of these natural resource extractors are very large emitters. So Russia, Saudi Arabia, Australia, et cetera. I mean, some of them, they appear as small because there are smaller economies, but you know, relative to the size of their economy, they are very, very large emitters. But is that really the best way, looking at the total? Because obviously China and India have lots more people than the United States. So let's look at per capita emissions. And there you get a real sense of just how unequal this is. And then if you like, the villains of the piece come out quite differently. So let's look a little bit more closely at the left side chart, the emissions based on production, but what you're doing within your national borders. So then the biggest emitters are the natural resource producers, Saudi Arabia, Australia, United States. Remember, United States is the second largest oil producer in the world. Just like we are the second largest wheat producer, the United States, a lot of this is consumed domestically. So yes, that's one part of it, but that's not all. In fact, it's not only because of the fact that it produces oil, that it's a large emitter. But the other big emitters, even in production terms, are yes, Russia and yes, Iran, again, oil producers, but look at Canada. It does extract some mineral resources, but it's a very high emitter in production terms when a lot of its in, um, economy is actually engaged in industrial and service activity. Japan becomes a very high per capita emitter. That is relative to the number of people, okay? China much less so. China less than half of what the United States is doing. And India and Indonesia, we are down there at the bottom at only two metric tons per capita relative to, you know, very, very large, 16, 17, 15, by, from the largest emitters. But, you know, even the moderate in this group emitters are in the seven to nine range of metric terms per capita. But now let's look at the emissions based on final demand, the consumption-based emissions that I was telling you about. And here the picture is, again, very different. The U.S. is away by a huge margin, 18 metric tons, in fact, more than 18 metric tons per capita, okay? And this is by a 2015 estimate uh, of the OECD, but nonetheless, I, it, it probably went up rather than went down over this period. And then the biggest per capita emitters are Japan, Germany. Why? Because they were part of the group, both the US, I mean, the US, Japan, Germany, France, Italy, Spain, all of these countries actually uh, sort of exported their emissions by shifting production, relocating, and depending on imports from, of, you know, if you like, carbon-intensive production from the developing world. So it's really this use of international trade which has meant that the consumption-based emissions are much higher for these countries. And by this criterion, again, China, is, it's, all, it's uh, less than one-third of the US. It was less than half of the US in production terms. It's less than one third of the US in consumption terms. But India, it's tiny, 1.5 metric tons only. 
Yet everybody is saying, you know, India, how dare you, and so on. So if you look at it globally, this is a really um, stark thing. And yet the per capita emissions in consumption terms are not taken account of in international negotiations. Now, agreed that in fact, you know, having it as an international negotiation rather than as a global public good discussion is already wrong, but that's the world we're in. And I'm just pointing out the fundamental inequality, if you like the sort of the neo-colonialism embedded in this particular uh, approach. And this is actually, I'm not going to spend too much time on this. We can come back on it if you are just, but essentially what you can do is you can say, well, look, you can reduce or your emissions depend uh, on your uh, total production as well as your um, uh, energy intensity ratio, how energy intensive is your production. And that depends on many things. It depends on the sectoral composition of your economy. It depends on how technology has reduced the energy intensity of activities within every sector. Uh, and then it depends on the kinds of energy you use. So it's not just how much energy you use, but how is that energy generated? And are you using coal, which is the worst, the dirtiest or brownest form of energy use? Or are you using renewables, which is the greenest? And between that, I mean, it begins with coal and then it is petroleum and then natural gas and then hydrogen, the latest fad in town, and then nuclear and then the renewables, solar and wind, which are obviously the best in terms of the emissions. And so, as you can see, pretty much every country has reduced its reliance on dirty fuel, except for India and Japan, where we have actually increased our reliance on dirty fuel in this period, in the period since the turn of the century. The energy intensity ratio has gone down pretty much everywhere, but there are other parts, but I, not sufficiently, if you like, but every country is actually you know, trying to reduce its energy intensity uh, as far, uh, um, relative to GDP. And some of that has to do, as I said, with sectoral compositions of GDP as well. Um, and now let's look at the changes in carbon uh, intensity components. Oh, sorry, I've already done that. Let me try and go down. Why am I not going down? Yes. So there are the internal elements of carbon emission reduction, as I said, reducing the energy use per unit of GDP. Then there is the within sector reduction of energy, and that is usually the result of technological changes, adoption of more energy efficient technologies. Then there's the type of energy used and the fact that renewable is the most desirable option. And then you, know, you go down the list. And coal clearly the worst. But there is the external part, which I already have mentioned, I've touched upon, let me just dwell on it a little bit more. This really happens from the 2000s onwards. And it's because of China uh, becoming this major manufacturing export driven by China. Some other countries play a little bit, you know, we are minor bit part players in this drama. China is the main actor in this. Over this period, there was a massive increase in manufacturing exports of China, more than 10 times in value terms and about 15 times in volume terms. And a lot of those imports required, uh, imports of the developed world required more carbon intensive production. In other words, they shifted the browner parts of production, whether it was the final good or it was the components and parts to the developing world, especially China. If you look at it, one of the worst sectors of heavily in, you know, carbon intensive sectors is non-electrical machinery and transport equipment. And the US imports of those increased by seven to eight times. That is 700 to 800% over this two decade period, well, actually just uh, 18 year period. And most of this was from China. So if you look at the carbon emission balance, these are calculations by the OECD, the final demand minus domestic production. In the USA, imports from just China were more than half of that balance. Two thirds nearly for Japan, almost half for Germany, you know, two, or two fifths for the UK and so on. And it's not just the advanced economies, it's the fact that they're multinational companies in particular 
were active in doing this. It is global multinationals based in the North that have been the major uh, protagonists in this shift in carbon emitting production, which took off really after China joined the WTO. Interestingly, when you look at China's trade with developing countries and Russia, it's the opposite way, it's the other way around. So China is exporting carbon emitting goods to the North and it is importing carbon emitting goods from its trade with other developing countries. And of course, Russia, which is no, a no brainer because in Russia it's dominantly petroleum exports. And so this gives you some idea about the carbon balance, okay? The gray, uh, lines or bars are the balance. So production is the blue line, final demand is the orange line in terms of the total, these are the totals in 2015, okay? And the balance, as you can see, the US has the largest balance globally, 774 million metric tons in 2015. Huge, huge, okay? And dominant in the whole world. Countries like India, South Africa, you know, we actually have positive balances. That is to say, we are the ones who are consuming less uh, in terms of carbon emission uh, than we are in terms of production. We're producing more and then we're exporting that difference, yeah? Okay. But remember that there's a wide variation in this mitigation strategy. I, I gave you some hint of that already. You know, many countries show that there's a decline in energy intensity of GDP. It's true that we have, like poor countries, India, South Africa, China, we have higher absolute levels of emission intensity. And of course, those who rely on petrochemicals and petroleum, hydrocarbon, like Russia and Saudi Arabia, we, they also have high levels. I showed you how India has the lowest absolute levels in both per capita production and consumption emissions. But the decline in terms of this energy intensity it varies from only 13% in Italy to nearly 40% in the UK, India somewhere in the middle in the 20% range. Um, and as I mentioned to you, both Japan and India actually increased their reliance on brown energy. But why is it that in fact, we are not doing better the developing countries? Even and remember, these are the bigger, more powerful developing countries, supposedly more powerful. A big reason is because we don't have sufficient access to the frontline technologies for energy saving and emission reducing production. Because the global intellectual property regime enforced by TRIPS has meant that multinational companies that are developing these technologies hoard them, they hold on to them, they do not share them. And the rich country governments are not forcing them to do that. Technology transfer is no longer I mean, we know that now with the pandemic and the, and the vaccine technology, but we know that technology transfer, which was talked about a lot in the early days of the COPs, you know, in the Paris Agreement and so on, it's really not even talked about anymore. People are not saying that you have to be sharing the technology that would enable countries to do both the declining energy intensity and the shift in the type of energy use. But now this is a very, very important chart. So I'm going to ask you all to look at this very carefully. This is emissions inequality by share of income. Now, okay, heroic attempt and it requires lots of assumptions. So yes, we recognize all of that. This is work done by Luca Chancel in the World Inequality Lab in Paris, uh, which is run by him and uh, Thomas Piketty and Emmanuel Sayers and others. But it's very important work. And, um, just for those of you who are interested, Luca was actually a, a student in JNU for a year. He was one of these people who had come from Sciences Po, and I taught him in a class on the international economy at that time. And he's doing really excellent work now on, especially this uh, uh, carbon emission inequality. So what's really striking about this? Two things. One is that the bottom half of the population in all the regions consumes much less or emits much less than the middle 40 and definitely much, much less than the top 10%, okay? Number one, that's the first point, that there's massive inequality within countries. So India's 1.5 comes about because of the fact that the poor are consuming even smaller. Like, you know, this, this 1.2 for South and Southeast Asia includes countries in Southeast Asia and so on. If you looked at just India, it is something like 0 0.8 for the bottom 50%. Incredibly low emission levels. 
okay, for the bottom. But even the bottom in the rich country is not emitting that much relative to the rich. Indeed, the bottom half of the population in Europe and North America emits much less per capita than the richest 10% of East Asia and South and Southeast Asia, okay? So in Europe, for example, the um, bo uh, bottom half of the population income group emits, uh, you know, uh, almost nine times less than the East Asian, 10 times less, almost, well, nine times less than the East Asian, and uh, less than half of South and Southeast Asia's richest decile. And that's quite striking. That tells you that it's really the rich of the world who are doing the emitting. But what's more significant is according to Chancel's data, you actually have a decline in the carbon emissions of the bottom half of the world in all of these regions. So they're getting more, you know, um, if you like, or, uh, environment friendly, they are reducing carbon emissions, the bottom half of the population. That's a very important point that I want you to uh, bear in mind because that what tells us that we really have to address the activities of the rich in all the countries, okay? Another study by Oxfam, it tells us that the per capita consumption footprints of the richest 1% in the world are more than 100 times that of the poorest half of the global population, okay? I, I gave you the regional breakdown. Now here is the Oxfam estimate of the global breakdown. The richest decile in the world, the per capita carbon emissions is more than 30 times that of the poorest half. Now remember, capitalism is global and the global economy is capitalist. So what are we saying? We're saying that it's the rich of the world who are responsible for destroying the planet. And what is really striking, if you could reduce the per capita footprint of the richest 10%, to what the IP, the UNFCC calls the 1.5 degree consistent level by even 2030, that would cut global carbon emissions across the whole world by over one third. Even if you just reduced it to the level of the European Union average currently, the average, not even the bottom half, the average at 8.2 tons per year, that would cut annual global emissions by over a quarter. Now, remember, this is not just North America and the Euro European Union, okay? Uh, yes, it's true that about a quarter of these global emissions come from the rich in North America and European Union. But around a fifth comes from the top 10% of China and India. So our rich are also responsible, okay? And as I mentioned, the bottom half globally has reduced carbon emissions in the past decade. But look at what we are thinking of in terms of policies. We're thinking of carbon taxes, which are deeply regressive. They disproportionately hit the poor, do not confront the excess consumption of the rich, will do nothing for that. And we think of border carbon taxes. That's the strategy now beloved of the EU and the Biden administration, because it doesn't hit anybody in, in, in the US, except for a little increase in prices, but it, is a, it attacks, if you like, the exports of the rest of the world. So we are thinking of these regressive policies when in fact the poor are not the problem, okay? The problem is the rich. A carbon tax is, is definitely going to hit incomes of the poor across the world. It will do nothing to prevent Elon Musk from taking another joyride to the moon. It doesn't matter. That level of tax means nothing to him. But the other huge thing to remember, and this is another way in which capitalism plays out by protecting the interests of not just you know, powerful lobby groups, but I would say fatally powerful lobby groups, is the continuing subsidies provided to fossil fuels. So you know the carbon tax is saying, well, carbon is priced all wrong. Yes, but one of the reasons it's priced all wrong is because of subsidies. So you know, everybody bandies around this estimate, $555 billion per year as uh, the average of the fossil fuel subsidies. But that is only the amount which is taken exactly from the budgetary record, that this is the amount handed over as a subsidy according to your government budget. The IMF has recently done a very careful and very interesting, important study, came out in December 2021, which calculates it as much larger because they're counting implicit subsidies. They're saying, yes, explicit subsidies, but that's a tiny part. 92% of total global subsidies is implicit. That is, it's, it comes through 
you know, uh, underwriting of loans, uh, various kinds of provisions, various um, uh, uh, non-budgetary allocations and, and so on, which actually amount to as much as nearly 6 trillion, 5.9 trillion is their estimate. Now in that China is the largest uh, provider, but the US is the second largest, and then Russia, India, the European Union. But just look at the fuel subsidies in the US, as you can see over the years, it's barely budged in terms of the amount. So just in 2020, when it's supposed to have come down, it gave 662 billion in subsidies to the fossil fuel industry, the US government. Now compare that to its commitment to global finance. It's been less than 6 billion in 2020. And in fact, the IPCC estimates that global climate finance from both public and private was less, it was about 640 billion in 2020, which is less than the fuel subsidies in the US alone of 662 billion. And as, I, and as I've said, globally, nearly 6 trillion. Now, if this is the kind of ratio, what are the chances? Obviously, the market incentives will remain skewed to carbon. And therefore, it's not surprising that not only do the, the, the big oil companies continue to you know, maximize their production and investment and so on, but you have global finance heavily oriented to financing the brown sectors and providing little driblets of so-called blended finance with all kinds of incentives and de-risking provided by taxpayers, tiny little amounts to green finance in relation to the continued huge financing of uh, the fossil fuels. And of course, things have got even worse now, right? The Ukraine war has reversed even those limited promises that were made in Glasgow. There's a rush back to fossil fuels in the US, in Europe, everywhere. And even these rich countries, they can afford to take this opportunity to shift to renewables. But in fact, they are shifting away from renewables now back to fossil fuels for this quick fix solution before a US midterm election or before some other election in France, whatever. So continuously, we provide these massive subsidies to fossil fuels. And it is largely because of the lobbying power of the oil industry. So let's be clear on this. It's not because this is something that needs to be done. There are ways of ensuring that gas prices at the pump for ordinary consumers do not rise while you encourage a shift away from fossil fuels by simply changing the nature of the subsidies for fuel investment. You can do that. Why is it not being done? Because of the lobbying power of big farm oil. Just like big pharma, we know that you know, oil and pharma clearly and finance are able to influence government decision-making. In, in very, very significant ways to the detriment of everyone else and the planet. But also, as I have pointed out, neo-colonialism still pervades, not just the macroeconomic strategies and, and possibilities in the world in terms of you know, the fiscal expansion of the North versus the South, but health, we have seen that already in the pandemic and the climate strategy. So can we opt for regional strategies instead? Well, those are constrained as we know by geopolitical tensions. And we need to, of course, overcome them to think of regional strategies. But within our countries also, we have a problem. We have our domestic inequality, and we have the growing power of the national elites who are going to fight back against attempts to restrict their carbon consumption. I'm talking about the top 10% in our own countries. And unfortunately, that has been abetted by more and more authoritarianism. And the fact that this rising authoritarianism can use new technologies of monitoring, surveillance, et cetera, through the digital world to actually establish even greater control. But finally, the point is that, you know, you don't need to do it this way. It's wrong to say, well, choose development or, fossil, you know, or the climate. That's wrong. It's not essential to, to have a development path that um, combines climate mitigation and poverty reduction. You can improve the energy efficiency levels of the economies, as I've said. You can change the structural composition of the economy. You can change investment and consumption patterns to activities that require less energy. Within that, within transport, you can say we are shifting away from a privatized polluting and heavily carbon emitting uh, uh, reliance on largely private vehicles to a much cleaner, greener, 
public transport system. You can, I mean, these are possible strategies, they're available. And within energy, you can reduce the share of the most carbon emitting sources. Uh, in fact, wind and solar are now competitive, but it, not only if you put forth the upfront investment. So you need to bring in the public investment and the financial incentives for that. Obviously, we have to change the pattern of urbanization so that there's less uh, private commuting required for basic living and working and, and schooling and so on. Now, all of this requires much more investment, obviously, but you know, there's an estimate by Bob Pullin, my colleague here in, in Amherst, and uh, Noam Chomsky in a recent book where they say that you can do this with 2.5% of GDP investment. So large economies can afford this. They've just spent, the big advanced economies have just spent a, a quarter of GDP on pandemic recovery measures. But in addition to finance, as I've mentioned, access to technology is critical. But this is also restricted, as we've seen by the TRIPS generated monopolies. So we need to think of TRIPS waivers, not only for the pandemic, but also for the climate related investments. But the international architecture, the TRIPS brings me to this point, the international architecture prevents this. So we have to change this global architecture. We have to use market exchange rates, not PPP to determine GDP and climate obligations. We have to bring in the role of historical carbon debt and consider the future carbon budget on a per capita basis. But we need climate finance based not as foreign aid, but on global public investment principles. We really have to see this as something that affects the whole globe and therefore we have to think of it as global public investment. And one route is by expanding SDRs not just providing individual companies, but setting aside, let's say half of these SDRs, which never get used by the rich countries for specifically climate finance across the world. We have to control the private finance that continues to fund brown projects. We have to redirect subsidies away from fossil fuels to renewable energy. Border carbon taxes are not a solution. They're just a trade protectionist device at the moment. Because you know the whole idea is that they would be based on compensation and sharing of revenues. There is no trust in the system. We don't believe that they're ever going to. I mean, these are rich country governments haven't even delivered on the minimal promise of $100 billion of climate finance a year that they promised in 2012. Nobody believes that they're going to actually do a dividend based, global dividend based on a border carbon tax. Currently, we don't have the trust and in international cooperation, which would uh, provide any you know, belief that rich countries would live up to this. And so border carbon taxes would just be trade protectionism without any of the other benefits. What you have to do is to share the green technologies and make them essential. So IPR regime has to change. Now, all this means therefore that we have to rethink the global framework in which we're operating. And uh, one of the groups that I'm currently associated with. This is the UN Secretary General has set up a high-level advisory board on effective multilateralism. And we are tasked with suggesting regulatory and other governance changes to the global architecture. I think these will have to be part of all of that. So finally, just to repeat, the Asian dilemma today, it's not about growth versus climate and the environment. It's not. So anyone who tells you this and says, oh, you know, the nationalist position requires that we fight carbon colonialism. Yes, there is carbon colonialism. But the solution is not to poison ourselves further with coal. It's about carving out an autonomous green economic strategy in an international system that currently restricts it. So we have to revive a progressive multilateralism. We have to obviously abandon all the unjust and counterproductive features of the existing processes that I've mentioned and the legal architecture. And we have to base it on more inclusive and networked cooperation in which we get people's voices much more actively heard. And that means people have to raise their voices within their countries as well. But meanwhile, while all this is happening, we have to do the unilateral action to shift to renewables. It's both possible and necessary. And so don't let anybody tell you otherwise. Okay, thank you for this, and I'm sorry that I have taken longer than I should have. Thank you so much, Professor Gold. It's a delight to hear you. And uh, it's a very pertinent topic, and we already had so many people asking questions in the chat box. So uh, according to the order, order in which they have asked their question, may I invite Nikita first to unmute and ask her question?
then Jhilam, and then uh, Dava. So uh, if you're comfortable, you can unmute and ask your questions. If not, then um, I will read out. So I'll give five seconds to Nikita to unmute herself and ask her first question. Thank you. And a great presentation and very useful insights, mom. Thank you so much for your presentation. So I have, you know, a couple of clarificatory questions. One is regarding uh, so, uh, the question that I have posted here was regarding you mentioned that, you know, just the bottom uh, half that are reducing their consumption, right? So the emissions are going down for them. So what is leading to this reduction in the emissions? Is it that the composition of this 10% has changed and that's why we are seeing this reduction or is it driven by, you know, change in the consumption patterns that they're having? Uh, you are muted. Sorry about that, yes. Yes, that's a very good question, Nikita, and it really does require much more research. Now, remember, this is relatively recent research published by the World Inequality Lab and came out really in January this year, okay? Uh, I have talked to Luca about this also. It requires much more detailed research. I would recommend anyone, anyone who's interested. This is actually a great area for future and current research right now. And it would obviously vary from region to region you know, how and what exactly has been driving it. Certainly in the poorer regions of the world, this is being driven just by reductions in consumption capacity. Yeah, we know absolute consumption has declined in India, for example, but that's not the only reason. It's also the case that a lot of the carbon emitting production has become more expensive. So there is a shift, you know, the, the consumption patterns have shifted in some ways, uh, relying more on certain services rather than on the material producing inputs. And some of the more carbon emitting production has become more expensive for the bottom half, okay? Because of regressive taxation, because of all of the things that we've been mentioning, okay? Is it that they are shifting to more sustainable forms of consumption? I don't think we can say that confidently. I think it depends. It, some of it could just be repressed rather than you know, a, a sort of positive ecological shift. In some countries, it could well be positive. I, it needs much more detailed breakdown and analysis and, you know, careful looking at what's going on. But I think the big story is, is not so much, I mean, it's important to, to note it about the poor because all the policies are directed against the poor. But the big story is the rich. The big story is the rich whose carbon emissions are exploding and they're exploding all across the globe. So in our own country, we have the top 10%, which by the way, includes all of us. Huh? We are all in the top 10% in this group today. Our carbon emissions, and it's not difficult to see, right? Everybody uses air conditioners now. When I grew up, you know, my family, which was already in the top 10%, did not use air conditioners. Everybody uses, you know, many, many different things, which are all more carbon emitting in terms of the production and, the con and consumption. But the absolute richest, it's no hold bad, whether it's in terms of the flight, et cetera. So, so we should be addressing that kind of consumption. Yeah. Uh, no, we, that point. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, please go on. Yeah. No, no, go ahead. You, you are saying, what about the poor? Why are they reducing it? Yeah, that, uh, like, mm. as you have mentioned, it would yeah. require a detailed yeah. inquiry yeah. into why that is yeah. happening. But uh, why I'm interested in this question is because, you know, there is this kind of an inequality and the wedge is widening, right? Because mm -hmm. the rich can afford to even, you know, offset the costs that yes. are coming from these emissions, the poor cannot. Yes. So seeing that their emissions are, you know, going down even further. So that is a bit of a concern. In, that I Absolutely. Have. No, I, 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 this is a reflection of the inequality, the broader inequality, right? I mean, we know that the shares uh, of the bottom 50 are actually declining, just like wage shares of income are declining, shares of the bottom 50% of the population are declining as well, right? So yes, global inequality has increased. I think that's what you all know, right? You, everybody is now familiar with that reduction. My concern is that if the strategies that are being used to confront the carbon crisis are further inequalizing. You know, they are adding to that more pressure on the poor. And as you mentioned, it doesn't, a carbon tax is negligible for the rich as a share of the income. It doesn't bother them. Yeah. I'll let others ask their questions. Yeah. And, you know, at the end, we have time. I have some more follow-up questions. Okay, sure. All right, so Gina, you can go next. 
Okay, she is unable to mute herself. So I'll just ask her question. How should climate change policies be designed to reduce inequality? So I think it's exactly following on from what we were just talking about. I think carbon taxes are regressive. So it should not be a blanket carbon tax. It should be taxes on particular kinds of consumption in addition to regulatory consumption uh, activities. So something like, let's say, a private joyride to the, to the moon should simply not be allowed. It's just so completely wasteful. You know, Even if you taxed it at 500%, Mr. Musk and Mr. Bezos would still do it. So simply disallow certain types of consumption, which is easy to regulate. It's been done many, many times by the most capitalist economies of the world in the past. But a large part of the extremely capital intensive kinds of luxury consumption, expenditure taxes that are oriented to the type of expenditure, they should be prohibitively high. Okay, so uh, if you like the first air conditioner, fine. The second air conditioner attracts a higher rate. The third air conditioner attracts five times the rate of taxation and so on. Uh, electricity consumption, again, you know, the um, Delhi does it to some extent, but it must be much, much higher. Per capita consumption of electricity, the higher you are, uh, the more the rate that you pay, for example. So expenditure taxes that are oriented towards um, production. But most of all, the shift to renewables is viable. It just requires significant public investment. That public investment is not forthcoming. So the shift to solar panels, to electric vehicles, et cetera, et cetera, it's not just telling automobile companies, please be good, then shift to electric vehicles. It's putting a tax on the non-electric vehicle. It is demanding, it's providing subsidies for solar panels relative to others. Um, this, uh, you know, et cetera. So you need to have a combination of fiscal policies and direct public investment, okay, which would actually shift. And in China, that's the story, huh? it's direct public investment and public subsidies that made renewable energy viable globally. So we, we really have to do that. And it, is, it can be done, it's not impossible at all. You can do it using public development banks. You can use it using even the central bank if necessary. I think that uh, in turn uh, answers Eric Brown's question also saying that what existing institutions uh, may be leveraged to sort of because you mentioned World Bank, these multilateral institutions can also be plugged in to, you know, sourcing this kind of renewable capital or directing investments toward these. So uh, Eric, you can maybe take the question or follow up question in the informal session. Uh, there is another question by Dawa Sherpa. Would you like to unmute and ask the question? Hello? Yes, go ahead. Hi, Dawa, how are you doing? Fine, ma'am. Hope you are doing well. Yes, yes. Uh, ma'am, uh, my question was with respect to uh, the kind of political changes which are occurring uh, right now uh, with respect to the uh, kind of climate crisis which you are seeing. So my uh, to, to summarize my question, uh, is climate change pushing capitalism towards some form of kind of Malthusian population control kind of ecofascism? Or uh, are we seeing some kind of metamorphosis where we are heading towards some form of eco-socialism? Ah, I wish it was one or the other, Dawa. Isn't it kind of both? Doesn't it? Unfortunately, it plays out so differently in different parts of the world, right? You know, I was uh, last week, I was at the UN for a series of meetings. One of them was the meeting of the uh, Council for Population and Development. And uh, the uh, conclusion of that report, uh, that meeting, fortunately, I was also um, addressed the press conference at the end of it, is actually to say that it's not population that's the problem. In fact, in most countries, we are reaching below reproducing uh, reproduction fertility rates. Population is not the problem. It is the overconsumption of the rich that is the problem. And that was a conclusion of the council, which contains all of the UN members and so on. Uh, yes, but does that mean how does it play out in countries? And unfortunately, the, these archaic ideas that it's population control which is required, when 
it's evident that it's not the large mass of people who are doing this. It, it is the elites uh, and you know basically the nature of global capitalism which is enabling it. Uh, that is not uh, that's not really the issue. Yeah, um, and many governments like to raise this population thing as a bogey saying it's because of population that we can't do X or Y, we have too many people, that's why we are not able to, which is nonsense, right? Uh, the, however, in periods of scarcity, what happens? All kinds of bad things can happen. No doubt about it, let's not kid ourselves. You can get collective responses, but you can also get dog eat dog kinds of hunger games kinds of responses. You can get terrible, uh, dysfunctional, dystopian kinds of uh, social and political responses with violence, with suppression, with all kinds of things like that. Uh, you know, it's it's open. It's not, I don't think it's very clear that the world will go fr from what to this strategy or that, that trajectory. I think different countries, different societies, different areas, it's going to play out very differently. Already in Latin America, we see a revival of, you know, broadly left kinds of politics after a time when, yes, it seemed even there that fascism was the emergent tendency. In a few years, we have seen a revival of broadly progressive and leftist tendencies. So I would say the same thing is true in Asia. You know, we feel depressed, I think, many of us, at the trajectory that our politics is taking and the political economy that seems to be so deterministic right now. It's not inevitable, and it changes much more rapidly than we think, just as uh, the ecology is changing much more rapidly than we realize. So you're absolutely right that a sort of Malthusian-based approach to population, which is completely the wrong uh, approach, could well be one that is sought to be imposed by the powerful elites in their own countries. Whether that's successful or not depends on so many different factors, many of which, you know, it's so hard to predict. And I repeat something, I don't know if I've told you a lot, before in the past, but I do believe it that you know change comes from unexpected directions, not from necessarily the directions we're looking at. You know, in India we say, oh, look at the main opposition party, and it's all terrible, and so everything's lost. We can't do anything. Change doesn't necessarily come from the direction you're looking at. It can come from all kinds of ways, and it can come faster than you expect. We are living in a world of unprecedented natural change. These are not natural changes that anybody anticipated in the next decade. They're happening today as we speak. That's going to release all kinds of things. It could be terrible, it could be not so terrible. A lot of that depends on our ability to get essential ideas across. I mean, the idea that a carbon tax is not just a good thing, which is taken for granted by a lot of left in the world, leftist people in the world. We have to fight that idea. We have to give clear alternatives and we have to show how it's in the interests of the people at large that these other alternatives are followed. I think these, these things do have an impact. It, it's not sort of, you know, um, it, in other words, how something plays out, whether it plays out as a Malthusian strategy or plays out as a more progressive trajectory is not independent of what we try and say and do and spread the word about as well, yeah? Okay, and then we have Pragati. Uh, can I invite her to unmute yourself and pose the question? Uh, hi, thank you so much for this session. Uh, I think I just wanted to know a little bit about India's efforts to phase out coal, uh, if that is the kind of right approach that they're currently taking, uh, or, is, or is there some sort of equitable approach considering the massive employment that uh, the sector currently provides? So first of all, the sector doesn't provide massive employment, okay? Secondly, I don't really see serious efforts to phase out coal. I mean, they, they just started auctioning coal blocks again, for heaven's sake, you know. Um, I, coal is still the cheapest, no question about it. It's the cheapest form of energy. It's also the dirtiest. It's also killing us independent of climate change through the pollution it causes. Okay, I mean, the thermal power plant in Delhi, for example, where people in Delhi have lost 10 years of their life on average because of living in this polluted environment. So, um, no, the current strategy on coal is fatal. I, I mean, I seriously, I mean it, it kills people, it kills Indians. So this whole idea we need coal for development, that's crap. We now have 
solar and wind technologies that are scalable at many different levels. You can have very small village-based units. You can have medium-sized grids. You can have large grids. Large grids require lots of land, but you can have many different types of grid. They do require much more upfront investment. The tragedy is that despite talking about it, this, our governments, not just this government, even before they did not put that money in. At a time when China was investing much, much more heavily in solar energy, we didn't, we did little bits. And we expected the private sector to come up when they won't for things that are uncertain and risky and so on. So we have to do massive public investment away from coal to renewables. We just have to do it. And it requires big upfront investment, yes, but that's all it requires. It doesn't, after that, it pays for itself within, uh, within five to, uh, within a decade, definitely it pays for itself. So any, I mean, it should be a no-brainer for any government with a minimally medium-term vision to stop investment in coal, just stop it, and shift to investment in renewables. Okay, it, it's, I, I mean, I cannot understand those who argue that you have to have coal because otherwise you cannot electrify the villages and the poor people and blah, blah. No, that's simply not true anymore. So for us to persist in this is, is appalling. There are other elements of that strategy. There is the whole thing about you know, retrofitting existing infrastructure to make it greener, which is also possible. Again, it requires upfront investment. Public investment is the way to go. If you can't do it publicly, because these are all individual and more small scale, create subsidies to encourage people to do that. You know, um, these, these are all things which are being done in many um, parts of the world. For some reason in India, we're simply not doing these essential things. And I think our policy on coal, I repeat, it's not just bad for the climate and the planet, it is fatal to people. It displaces people, it doesn't employ that many. And by the way, the, that employment, I mean, if you've ever gone into a coal mine, you know that it's not the best employment in the world. You will employ many more people in the renewables in, and the technologies associated with all of the retrofitting that I've been talking about. There are estimates that have been done by Shovik Chakravarti and Rohit Azad, for example. It's a much bigger employment generator. So, you know, this whole thing, oh, how can we get rid of coal? It's employing so many hundred thousand people. Big deal. We actually generate, you have to get rid of coal if you want to survive. I mean, actually, seriously. So immediately think of ways to reallocate that labor and other labor to green and re renewable energy. It's possible technologically. The only constraints are financial, and that means the public sector has to get into it. Mm -hmm. Okay, now I'm gonna ask Eric to ask his question, and I'm going to team that up with a question from Jilam. Eric, may you go first, ask your question, and Jaiti, give me a moment to add mm -hmm. another question to it. Okay. Oh, me? Okay. Um, who did you say? Yes, you go ahead. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, I misunderstood. Um, no, I I was one. I asked the question about um, uh, what sort of um, institutions um, might be available to um, sort of be the basis for if they exist now for the kind of um, multilateralism that's oriented towards um, uh, green development and climate mitigation and so on. Um, because I, and I, the reason I raised it that way is because, um, for instance, the the World Bank seems set on using this um, this sort of de-risking paradigm of you know trying to uh, crowd in private resources and uh, from the things that I've read, it's not working very well. I mean, they're not literally not getting a lot of private investment, and um, I I have my very serious doubts about whether or not it's even the kind of investment that's even appropriate for these kinds of infrastructural projects. So I was wondering if you thought alternatives might be. Absolutely. Look, as I've been saying, I completely agree with you. I think all of this public-private partnership, blended finance, de-risking stuff is frankly yet more means of enriching large private capital globally. They, they manage to get in on every damn thing that happens in the world and extract a profit from it. Just as we allowed the whole vaccine development, which was essential, to become a plaything of the British pharma companies. Similarly, we're allowing climate investments, which are essential now for human and planetary survival, 
We are allowing those to be in the gift of large companies whose ultimate interest is not that. So no, we should not. And the money we are putting into underwriting loans, de-risking, et cetera, should be put directly into public investment. Or if you are going to subsidize, you do that with very strong conditionality. So I agree, the government can't do everything. You know, and especially when it's a small scale, diversified, local, blah, blah, you can't. But when you provide subsidies of any kind and all of this de-risking, et cetera, they're all just subsidies. When you provide those subsidies, you must put in conditionality. And that's something which is, it's striking that it is not being done at all. So it, one thing I would say, you shift from the carbon emitting fossil fuel subsidies to the green subsidies number one. But in those green subsidies, you make it very clear, you're not just going to get this money and then it's up to you. How do you, you know, do this? You actually force them to meet certain requirements, including sharing the technology in, and so on. And if they don't meet those requirements, you take care over. In other words, it's written into the contract that you will get taken over if you do not meet these requirements. So, I, I mean, we have to be tougher. We have to be and by the way, this is not even some crazy socialist talking, you know, this was what was done. Uh, if you read Mariana Mazzucato's Mission Economy, this was what was done during the whole moonshot thing. That companies that were involved, first of all, you had, it was a coalition of the willing. You actually make sure that they have to meet certain requirements. So you're competing for that particular project, knowing that these are the requirements. And then if you don't meet that, then you, you're not there, you're, you're out. Your bit of it is taken over. We really have to have that approach. You have to not just regulate these markets, but make it a public interest investment, if you like. So yes, the public sector directly invests and it can use many means. It can use the central bank, it can use the, the national or international development banks. It can do, you know, there are many ways in which the public can invest. And insofar as it cannot invest directly and it relies on private players, which is inevitable and, and necessary, you make sure that they are part, they're socially aligned. They, they are going to behave in the ways that you want them to because it's all written into the contracts. Right. That actually answers Jilam's question, which was what is limiting authorities to come up with public investment to sustainable production? So in some way you have answered that. So yeah, give... I want to buy that. Just uh, thank you, Jilam. I just, you know, really this point about conditionalities. The, you know what's happened to all of us? We hear conditionality and we think, oh my God, IMF, World Bank, Washington consensus, it's terrible. And we are um, immediately against conditionality. I think what's wrong, the Washington consensus conditionalities were the wrong ones. Okay, we need different conditionalities on private investors, not on the public. It's not the conditionality on the public. I mean, yes, there should be conditions on the public as well, accountability, transparency, all of that. But you need conditions whenever you are providing funds to the private sector. You have to make sure they are aligned with your goals, because if they're not, you're giving them a free ride to go and do terrible things, which you will then have to be left bearing the consequences of. So, yes, I think the issue of conditionality is very important in this dilemma also. I'm going to now invite Henny to make her comments. And with that, I will then hand it over to Satvik for saying the thank you. And then we'll have the informal session in case you have still some questions that need to be posed. Over to you, Henny. I'm sorry. Um, I just made some, uh, it's more like practical questions. I'm not really sure whether you're the person to ask. But talking about um, facing out coal, and uh, the impact it might have on the labor uh, force. Um, I was thinking, um, doesn't that mean, doesn't it mean that when you are implementing renewables that um, that is work on a higher level than people working in mines? And doesn't that mean that those people need to be educated? It's very different. You know, installing a solar panel is construction work. So it's not that all work in renewables is exactly the same. Retrofitting households is also, you know, basically largely construction and mechanical kinds of work. So it's not the case that all the work in renewables activities is of, you know, extremely educated. Just like 
in the coal sector, it's not that a coal miner is, uh, you know, very uh, educated necessarily, but a large part of the other activities in coal do require educated workers. So the renewables also, it's a, it's a complicated set of activities put together, which includes not just the production of these, you know, the electricity, the transmission of that electricity and the use of particular, you know, types of things like panels or whatever, but also the associated activities that make it possible. A large part of that is construction. Okay, okay. And the other question I had was about, um, I'm part of, a, of a, an energy corporation here, mm -hmm. which is part of a bigger uh, international corporation called Rescoop. And I was wondering whether are, there are that kind, and I don't mean like collective um, purchase of, of, of solar panels. I mean, really investing together in uh, renewable energy and also be uh, the customer of your own corporation. So you're also using that energy. Is that something that's that's been done in India? Uh, you know, to be honest, Henny, I don't know. I don't, mm -hmm. I mean, maybe somebody else here in the audience has some knowledge about this. I have not heard about any such, but I mean, it's not, you know, hypothetically, it's certainly possible. And maybe there are some that I don't know about. But yes, I would definitely, I will explore this. Okay, lovely. Thank you. Thank you, by the way, for your interesting uh, presentation. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Ghosh. So with this, we will formally conclude. I would like to thank Professor Ghosh for your time. We're extremely lucky to have you again. And thank you for the wisdom. And we have to think and really act urgently to protect our species. Uh, this is a grim picture, and we cannot and should not ignore. I thank participants thank for their uh, participation and thoughtful questions. Please join us for the remaining sessions of the series. We'll be hosting Prabhat Patnaik, Catherine Napista, Barbara harris Y, Krishnamurti Subramaniam, Saila Jafanil, and Saskia Sasen. So keep an eye on the YSI page. Your participation and engagement matters. Thank you, Professor Ghosh. Thank again. you. And Bye, everyone. Bye. And with this, we formally end the session. Thank you.